Father, we do really want to come with thanksgiving in our hearts into your presence. We don't want to be anywhere else. We don't want our hearts to be anywhere else. We don't want our minds to be anywhere else other than fixed on you and worshiping you for who you are. Thank you, Lord. Help us to truly, utterly worship you. Amen.
It's all about you. It's all about you. 
King of endless world, no one could express how much you deserve. No one we can hold. All I have is yours. Every single breath. I'll bring.
Father, we do just thank you so much for 
the privilege of worshiping you. Thank you for what has already been shared through Jenny and through Angela. Lord, don't let us just rush on beyond that, but let us just dwell in that for a bit of what you've already done and said. And we do pray that you'd speak your truth, your life, your word to us, each one of us this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 28, from verse 16 through to 20. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to, to observe all things I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. All authority, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. The absolute lordship of Jesus Christ. He is King, He is Lord, and the full impact of that is that there actually is no other real authority. There really is no other proper authority in heaven and on earth. And what we must never ever lose sight of is that this is the first and all governing proclamation of the gospel by and to the church. It's the church's full and first and all-inclusive message. Before anything else can ever be preached or said about Jesus Christ, He has got to be set forth first as Lord. He has got to be recognized and acknowledged as Lord. That is the first great spiritual foundation of the church. And through the book of Acts, this is how the church fulfilled the Great Commission. The simple declaration of the absolute lordship of Jesus Christ. They weren't saying, come to Jesus to fix your problems, get healed, get forgiven. Or they weren't even saying, come to Jesus to get eternal life. The simple declaration through the book of Acts was, He is Lord. There's a word that's used twice in Matthew 28. It says they worshipped Him. And that's that word that you probably have heard about before, proscunio, to prostrate yourself before someone, before something. You come down and you prostrate yourself before. The picture that's always used is of a dog coming and licking its master's hand. The disciples worshipped Him prostrated themselves before Him. Before anything else, they acknowledged His absolute Lordship, His total authority. And can I just say it again, that the cornerstone of the church declaring the gospel to all nations is the absolute Lordship of Jesus Christ. It's not to go to other places where there are other religions and compare the teachings of Jesus with the great teachers of those lands, and then try to show how His teaching is better. There's a very strange thing called comparative religions that people teach. And I can think of few things that are a greater waste of time. If you have the pearl, if you have the great treasure, if you have a 10,000 carat diamond, it's like you saying, well, I really feel led to go and do an in-depth study of rubbish dumps. That's the picture. Comparative, comparing Jesus. I read a little parable this morning that really just amused me. The tiger and the donkey were having a long argument. The tiger said grass is green, the donkey said grass is blue. So eventually to try and sort it out they went to the lion. The lion said, what's the problem? The donkey said, well, grass is blue. So the lion said to the donkey, that's great, you're right. Grass, grass is blue, you can go your way. Then he turned to the tiger and he said, 
you, your punishment is you've got to keep quiet for 10 days. And the tiger said, but, but what's the problem? Grass is green. And the lion said, I know that grass is green, and you know the truth, and your problem is you're wasting your time arguing with the ass. <laughs> you know the truth. Just stand and, and be confident in your truth and stop wasting time arguing with asses. And that's what comparative religion is all about. It's not to go out with the ethics of Jesus, to try and elevate people to a higher level of moral life. A waste of time. The private schools in this country that were all started by churches stand testimony to that. You can't go and just try and elevate people up to the ethics of Jesus. You just breed monsters. It's not even primarily to go out and preach Jesus as Savior, which very often can result in people accepting Him for their own personal benefit, for the blessing that will come to them. Everyone wants to be happy, to be delivered from their misery, and to, they want some escape. And so the gospel is taken purely as something that's going to make their life happier and more comfortable. It's a very, very good deal. But no, the cornerstone of the church is that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is King. Jesus is sovereign. And everything else has to follow on after that, behind that. The call to the church was to go out to people and say, in Acts 2 verse 36, God has made him, this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. That's the message. He is sovereign, demanding your absolute and total prostration, your surrender to him, as you would never ever even surrender to an earthly monarch. He has to be Lord. And, and it really is a very, very big and we can never preach the Lordship of Christ with any real conviction unless we are prostrated before His sovereignty. If we are not bowing before Him, and if He is not totally Lord of our lives, we do not have the right to go and tell other people to make Him Lord of their lives. And the disciples all had to get there. That's why they couldn't go out and fulfill this commission until 50 days had passed. 40 days of Jesus' appearings, establishing the absolute truth and certainty of His resurrection, and then establishing as well His Lordship, confirming those two great truths of the gospel. He is alive. He is Lord. That's what Jesus was doing in those 40 days. And then another 10 days of prayer till the Spirit came and made that lordship, that exaltation, and inward reality in them. Then they could go out, but not before then. It had to be something that was made real in them. All their reason, their reasonings in their heads, had to be brought under that lordship. All their natural mentality, their will, their feelings, their emotions, everything had to come under that lordship. And I know it seems like often I, I seem to, in, in recent weeks, really been picking on poor old Peter, not Pollock, the disciple. But Peter really is the example here. Peter, in his own mind and in his own reasonings, was not really convinced that Jesus was the Messiah because he reasoned it out. Everything seemed to be so contrary to reasonable expectations about what a Messiah should be. A king, a great powerful ruler who would sweep in and overpower all the enemies of God and deliver Israel and establish it as a great country. Someone who would bear all the marks of one sent by God and empowered by God, before whom no one and nothing would be able to stand. That was his and most other people in Israel's at that time that was his expectation of the Messiah. But there wasn't anything about Jesus like that. And when the Lord challenged him as to whom he was, 
Peter then, incredibly, in Matthew 16, verse 16 and 17, says, you are the Christ, the Messiah, you're the Son of God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it to you. But my Father in heaven has revealed it to you. And then, in spite of this incredible revelation, and in spite of Peter's very enthusiastic confession, as soon as Jesus, further on in Matthew 16, talks about going up to Jerusalem, being delivered into the hands of the rulers, and then eventually being killed, Peter breaks in, far, far be it from you. No ways, God. No ways. This will never, ever happen to you. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block, for you do not mind the things of God, but the things of men. What's happening here? Peter has this great revelation, this huge truth revealed to him by the Father of Jesus' lordship, Jesus' Jesus's messiahship. But then his actions totally contradict that. Why? It's because his reason hasn't yet been conquered. He's not yet a conquered man inside. And he will actually very soon even deny the Lord Jesus. That's how bad it will get. How on earth could he deny one whom he was so sure was God's Messiah, God's Christ? It's because he was not yet conquered. And the only way he could be conquered and the only way we can be conquered, the only way you can be conquered, is through the cross. It was impossible before then. The only way Peter could be conquered was through the cross. You see, we can get some great revelation. Perhaps we're reading the Word, and in a flash we see some great things which only God can reveal to us. But then we go on. And I've known it to go on for years in some cases, where that truth just never masters our inner life. The subjection to that truth just never happens. The cross has never been allowed and been given the freedom to work that truth into us and establish it in us. The Great Commission is all based on the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And it has got to be made good, first and foremost, in those who are commissioned with the Great Commission. You can't even get on to the rest of the Great Commission until the Lordship issue has been settled. Can the Lord do exactly as He likes with me right now? Can I say and mean it, Lord, I have no plans for my life flowing out of my great strong desires, reasons, preferences. Yes, I know what I would like to do. I have some ideas and plans. But Lord, all of that is entirely now in your hands, your Lordship. It's all about what you want me to do, where you want me to be, how you want me when you want it, it's all for you to make the plan and for you to have the government of my life. Like those bond slaves of old, take me to the door, pierce my ear. Let the Lordship be all in your hands. That's where we begin with the Great Commission. It has to begin there. The absolute sovereignty of Jesus Christ. All authority given to Him. But it's also our job as the church to make absolutely sure that it stays there. That it always remains the cornerstone of our message. The Lordship 
of Jesus Christ. And in any church where that doesn't remain the cornerstone, things will go very wrong very, very quickly. I come across more and more people who say to me, I'm just so sick of all the church nonsense. The seeker sensitiveness, the political correctness, the continual striving to entertain and keep people amused and get them to come back again. I saw a couple on Friday who said to me, we're just so tired of the charismatic churches watered down, wishy-washy message. They said to me, nowadays we just go to a tiny little traditional church. We go, we worship, we listen to a simple gospel message, and we go home. That's us. All authority. The King James translates it as power, but it doesn't mean power as in force and strength and might. It means the right to rule. That all authority means I have the right to rule, I have the right to govern. All right to govern and to rule has now been given to him. And in the original tense, and, and it's not me that's saying it, it's the clever people, but in the original tense it, it really reads, all authority has now been given to me. All authority has now been handed over to me. How, how is it that it was now given to him? Obviously, it's now been given to him through the cross and because of his resurrection. And let's just look at three areas. Because if, if it's all authority, it covers everything. But let's just concentrate three areas where that all authority that has been given to him affects us. Firstly, his resurrection was the confirmation that he was absolutely sinless, without any sin whatsoever. He had claimed while he was walking on the earth to be without sin, and absolute rulership in God's kingdom demands that, absolute sinlessness. God is not going to have an unholy ruler ruling in his kingdom. No unrighteous one can occupy the throne of creation. No sinful one could ever possibly claim to have all absolute authority. Jesus claimed to be without sin. And Hebrews 4.15 tells us that even though he was tempted in every way, just as we are yet without sin. Jesus came. He had a human nature, but he was not a human being. There's a great deal of difference. He was different to all human beings in this respect. He was totally without sin. So he was different to every single, had a human nature, but different to every human being in that he was totally without sin. And he was subjected to the full force of every test and temptation and was made sin for us in the hour of his cross. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. He who knew no sin was made sin for us. And he triumphed. He did not yield in one detail or one respect or for one instant. And his resurrection was God's seal upon his absolute sinlessness. So that he could say in the hour of his resurrection, all authority has now been given to me because of my absolute sinlessness. It was in his resurrection that all authority was given to him because his resurrection was God's seal upon his sinlessness. And the good news is that he is Lord over all sin. He is master of all iniquity. He has subdued every unrighteousness. He is above every transgression. And therefore, He is Lord. 
His sovereignty is not just because the father gave it to him, like a, fa a doting father giving it to his son, but it is by virtue of who and what he is. Men are not called to bow to Jesus of Nazareth as their Lord because he's a great man, because he's a great teacher, because he's better than all other men and prophets and leaders. They are called upon to subject it themselves to him because he is above every question about his nature and his character. He is outside of the realm of ordinary humanity. We are not dealing with a superman. We're not dealing with someone who stands head and shoulders above other men. We are dealing with someone who is outside of the realm of the whole of this humanity. He's not a human being like we are human beings, even though he came having a human nature. He is outside of that. It is another humanity, a different humanity to ours. Until we recognize that, we do not have the gospel. It is another humanity, another human nature that is not known in this creation and into which we have now been incorporated and into which we are all the time being conformed. That's the change that's happening in you. And it doesn't take place in an instant. We are 1 Corinthians 6 verse 17, joined to the Lord one with him in spirit, and then the process begins of dealing with the sin question. And the sin question is always dealt with in light of his perfection. And never forget that the, the great power by which the sin question is only ever dealt with is his sinlessness. That's what we mean when we break bread. We are taking his body, a sinless body. We are saying, in effect, we appropriate another humanity and we make that humanity now the basis of our very life. In John 6, Jesus said, we must eat of his flesh and feed upon him. You see, if you just feed upon someone who's just like you, you're going to stay exactly the same, aren't you? You feed on, on, on somebody, uh, another human being, you're just going to stay exactly another human being. But to feed upon Christ is to feed upon another order of being altogether outside of ourselves, totally different to us. That's the great power of the gospel, that Christ is of another order outside of this one altogether, and men have to recognize the utter supremacy and otherness of the Lord Jesus Christ and bow to that. He's Lord in the realm of sin. He alone has conquered sin. We do not have the resources to deal with our sin in ourselves. If we did, Everybody would be running around as little angels, all tiptoeing through the tulips as little angels. Yes, confess our sins, repent of them, turn from them, but don't then just leave a blank, empty space. Turn to the one who has all authority over your sin. Feed upon him. Look unto Jesus the sinless one, to deal with the sin problem. Also, his resurrection gave him the right to bring men to God. He said very, a very unequivocal thing about himself. He said, I and the Father are one. Saying that his incarnation was nothing other than God coming to earth in human form. That here in man form, God is found and God and man are joined together. His resurrection is the seal upon that. God attesting to that. That 2 Corinthians 5.19, God was in Christ reconciling the world 
to Himself. God confirmed and proclaimed that by raising Him from the dead. That here is, is one who is so totally with God that they are one, not two, but one. And that means that He has the position, the right to bring men to God. That is His Lordship. That is His authority. The authority and the right because He is so utterly one with God to bring men to God. So much so that John 14 verse 6, Jesus says, No man can ever come to the Father except through me. No man can come to God except through Jesus Christ. He's in that position. Right now, he is in that position. It's part of his all authority. The Father has handed over to Jesus man's ability to come to God. That's the gospel. The gospel is that you cannot get to God any other way now other than through Jesus Christ. He's Lord in this realm of access to God. Men have tried for 2,000 years now to find ways of getting to God and coming to God and going to God other than through Jesus Christ. And they've all been a waste of time. He governs this matter of union with God. That authority was given to him in his resurrection. And so scriptures like come boldly now to the throne of grace. There is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Come, all who are thirsty. And many more that we could quote. They've all been made good for us. They've all been opened up to us in Christ Jesus. The veil has been torn in two. The way is opened. The way to God has been opened. And there is now a way through Jesus Christ. Hebrews 4. Seeing uh, from verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The way to God has been opened up in Jesus. Jesus has full responsibility now. Then, thirdly, His resurrection was the confirmation that He has all authority over the powers of darkness, the prince of this world. He made a claim that as he went to the cross, the prince of this world was about to be cast down, cast out. John 12, 31. Now is the prince of this world cast out. Since Genesis 3, the prince of this world has been drawing men to himself and away from God. Satan was very, very aware that when Jesus came to earth, his power as the prince of this world was at that point being directly challenged. Just go and look at all the things that took place around the time of the birth of Jesus. It was all to do with the prince of this world being aware that his authority was under threat. And as Jesus went to the cross and came out of the grave, Satan's authority and power to draw men to himself and deceive men was broken. John 12, 32, And I if I be lifted up from the earth, I will then have the authority to draw men to me, to myself, says Jesus. When God raised Jesus from the dead, He put His seal upon that. And so soon after that, that power began to operate on the day of Pentecost, and it's operated ever since. Men were so dominated by dead works, and men were so in the grip of the devil 
that Jesus had to say to the Jewish leaders of his time, John 8, 44, you are of your father, the devil. He said it to the most religious, committed people of his day. You are of your father, the devil. You belong to the prince of this world. And just remember that Paul was among those leaders that he was speaking to. But then you have Paul, a man who Jesus says, of whom Jesus said, your, your father is the devil himself. And all the power of the devil is smashed to pieces in one moment on the road to Damascus by the authority and the lordship of Jesus Christ. Power over all the power of the enemy, the casting out of the prince of this world, that is the authority that is vested in him. All authority given to him. The church's weakness and ineffectiveness, and I include myself here among and part of, is largely due to the fact that we don't stand in that truth. We stand on Christian ground, Christian truth and creeds, the doctrines, the truths, the historical facts, but not in the spiritual power of that, where we challenge the power of darkness in the lordship of Jesus Christ. You can't rebuke the devil in yourself and bind him. We, we, ever since I've got saved, we've been binding the devil in our authority and nothing happened. But that we are confronting the power of darkness in the authority and the lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, says the Lord Jesus in effect, because lordship is mine over sin, because lordship is mine to bring men to God, and lordship is mine over all the power of Satan, go and preach that. That is your commission. That is your gospel. God has made redemption available to everyone. Jesus has been given the power to draw all men to himself. And if men are not saved, it's simply because they have not accepted the redemption that is already theirs, already available to them in Christ Jesus. The work is done. Jesus cannot and will not do anything more to draw men to himself. May the Lord find us as those who in the first place are utterly prostrate worshippers. At his feet, as Lord over my reason, my mind, my will, my heart, over things, over everything. May God find us in that place, prostrate before his all authority. And then, out of that, may he, may he be able to lead us out, here or there or wherever he will, with the gospel of the absolute sovereignty of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Let's stand if you want to. We do thank you, God, that all authority has been given to you, Lord Jesus. And yet we so often live with a Jesus who has a bit of authority. Even a Jesus who has 90% authority, but there's some little bits that you don't yet have full authority. And I really do pray for us all, Lord that we be found as those who just acknowledge that all authority that has now been given to you, Jesus. That, Lord, you're the only one who has authority and has broken and has the power over sin. We, we have power over some of our stuff some of our sins but we don't have all authority and I pray Lord that we really do come to you and look to you to deal with that root 
that stronghold of sin and iniquity and transgression. And that, Lord, you have all authority to draw men to yourself. You alone have authority to, to, to draw even those we love, even as, as we've heard this morning, Lord, those who we've given up on and those we said that person will never come to Jesus. You have that authority, Lord. And even in praying for the lost, give us that understanding. It's only you, Lord, who can draw them. We can't. We can't bring them to Jesus. You've been given the authority to draw men to God. And just remind us again, Lord, of the unavoidable truth that the prince of this world has been cast out. Lord, I believe for many of us years ago, we used to spend far too much time rebuking the devil and fussing about the devil. And yet many of us have swung to the other extreme where we just never ever walk in the authority of the victory you have won over the enemy. And so Lord, bring us to where you want us to be to walk in the authority and the all authority of Jesus Christ over the prince of this world. Help us to walk in that. To not just talk about it or pray about it, but to really walk and live in the victory you've won for each one of us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you. We worship you. Amen.